I guess we've got 20 minutes here, or we're going to talk about growth and traction. Um, and so, I mean, Ryan's obviously at a point where I'm sure a lot of people in the audience would want to be one day, but they obviously had to start from somewhere as well. So, Ryan, maybe if you can talk a little bit about, you know, you get started, you've got an idea, you get a, you know, a really small team together, and then you want to grow. I mean, what was sort of the first roadblock you hit in terms of really, you know, expanding your company? So we only have 20 minutes, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. There's no timer though, so I don't know. I guess they're gonna have to drag us off. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think the first first the biggest challenge uh, to to most startups is is finding product market fit. Uh, you know, I, I think some people know the story, but you know, quickly, uh, Hootsuite came out of an agency I founded in 2000. We in, in that agency, we're doing services work, uh, building websites and other services work for customers. And, and on the other uh, hand, um, we were building products. So we built a, a string of products, a content management system, an e-commerce system, a video contesting platform, a uh, sports league management tool, a, a ton of different products, all with varying levels of success. So we had um, some of them that, that uh, you know, grew and grew nicely, some of them that were you know, OK businesses, and some that we killed. Um, the, the biggest challenge, though, was finding you know, the monster opportunity. And um, we hunted for that for a long time. And, and I think you know, one, of the, one of the pieces of advice I have for anybody is just, just look for the big waves and, and build something around a big wave. You know, if, you're, if you're out there surfing and there's no waves, you just, your arms are just going to get sore. Uh, but if you can find a big uh, economic seismic shift in the market um, and get in front of that, you're going to be, in a, I think, in a way better place than, than trying to um, you know, change a, maybe something that, that is just not as, as, as progressive and, do, and doesn't have as much of a seismic shift to it. So when you started the company, your core team, I mean, how many were you and, and who was it, sort of you know, the first kind of founders? So, so we had a 21-person team at the agency when we when we when we started on Hootsuite. We were at, at one point at about 30. Uh, we had one of our products, the the you know in 2007 when you know, we saw the economic changes, um, we had to scale down a little bit. One of our products just tanked immediately on the on the economic change, um, and so we were we were hovering around 21 people. Um, it came out of the, the kind of need for this came out of our team that was was doing social media campaigning for our customers. Uh, they were managing Twitter and Facebook uh, on multiple customer accounts, and they had you know five different browser windows open and accidentally sending messages out of the wrong window on the wrong account, and so it was it was a real challenge. Um, so it, it, the need came out of that team. We um, started with, with uh, you know, I think two really talented people on it. I think about them, them as the, the right and the left brain, a, a really talented UI designer and a, and a really talented architect. Um, and, and, you know, to, to kind of like paraphrase Malcolm Gladwell, uh, the team at that point had had their, their 10,000 hours under their belt. We'd been, you know, as I said, working on a lot of different products leading up to this. Um, and everything just kind of, uh, you know, came together really nicely. So, so there was a point, you know, you, you kind of, you saw this problem, obviously, in the market. You put this product together. Um, was there a point when, you know, it's sort of that thing, you know, you took off and you realized, okay, this is what we're going to do. And how did you sort of rally the rest of the organization around you know, this, this dashboard, the social yeah. media manager that you are now known for? Yeah, so, so you know, we, started, we put it out. We started using it internally as a tool. We loved it. Um, you know, our initial goal was to build, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with 37 Signals Basecamp, which was a, a, you know, a really hot SaaS product at the time. They were putting out a little, lot of really interesting thought leadership around SaaS. Um, our, our goal was to build 37 signals for social media, to build Basecamp for social media. Um, so, so you know, we, we put the product out to the community, uh, and, and we saw very quickly uh, a really nice organic adoption of, and a virality to the product. Um, you know, I, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, and, and they're like, I'm building this product, and I would need to know how to do AdWords. To, to advertise it, and and I think that's um, that's the wrong way to do it. I think you know you build a build a great product, uh, start small, iterate. Our first our first version, you know, if I look back at it today, it would probably be embarrassing. Like it, what what it looked like, it was a single page, you know, a submit button, you know, maybe some team workflow. Um, but get a product out there and start to see how it gets adopted naturally. 
you know, does it, do you have, you know, we started with our team and then we had, you know, 10 users, then the next day 20 and the next day 30 and 100 and 200 and 200 and 300 and 350. And, and so there was a, a really great organic adoption to it. Um, if you, if you direct add product at, at, a, at a product when it's starting, uh, you're putting an artificial crutch under it. And, and the second you pull away the ads, if the product tanks, you have a, a real problem, right? And so what you're doing is artificially masking the natural adoption of your product. And, and I think that, um, so, uh, you know, trying that too soon can really be detrimental to the but, to I mean, the there's, it's not like that there's sort of, because I'm sure a lot of people here have a product that, um, you know, there are others like it and they are competing even at an early stage and they might truly have the best product and be known to have that, but they're just being drowned. Maybe there's a larger, you know, corporation doing a similar thing to them. I mean, is, do you think that it, if your product isn't getting organic growth or initially that you need to do something else or is there, is there a place for advertising and marketing at, at the early stage? Uh, so I'm not saying don't advertise and I'm not saying don't market, but I, I, I caution people around it. Uh, we were in a very competitive space. Uh, there were products like TweetDeck, Seismic, um, I, there's probably 10 other competitors out there. All of them were funded. Seismic had, I think, 13 million in funding. And, and um, so, so we were competing in a, in a very um, noisy market. Uh, we had a different business model than them. And ultimately, we had a better product. We, we invested our advertising dollars in building a product and, and focused on that. A lot of people uh, invested money in PR. I had, um, I remember two occasions, uh, one was one of my team members, and, and they came up to me and they're like, hey Ron, I think we need to do some PR like Seismic. And I was like, okay, I kind of just bit my tongue, and i like, all right, good, good to hear. You know, I think, we're, I think we were working on that. You know, we were doing a lot of organic, we were doing a lot of, you know, we were marketing, but we, weren't, we didn't have a $20,000 a month PR agency that we were, you know, we were building our product and focusing on core product fundamentals. Um, you know, engaging and, and marketing and advertising can be very expensive. And for a young startup, I wanted to put my $20,000 a month into engineering. And we did that. And we continued to engineer and evolve our product ahead of the market. And that was, um, that was a challenge, but it was strategic in terms of what we did. So when you guys started, you were Canada and the U.S., right? And yeah. then at, at what point, um, you know, we're Canadians. We all know we need to be, you know, international at the beginning to kind of keep, keep, keep our head above the water, especially competing with U.S. companies. But... Um, you know, is there sort of a, can, can that go too far? And I mean, what, how was the decision, the, the thought process to say, okay, well, we're doing pretty good in North America, but we need to be in Asia, we need to be in Europe, and how do you make that decision? So, you know, I, I think this really depends on everybody's business, and every business is going to be completely different. I'm not, I'm not going to encourage anybody to start localizing in Japanese as, a, as the, their first step of building out their product. It, it comes when the timing is right. Um, we, uh, we did see, as, as I said, we had this organic virality to our product, and we did start to see um, good adoption in, in Japan and China and, and a bunch of other markets, and it was it was exciting to see. You know, like we every day I would monitor the mentions of Hootsuite on Twitter, and I would see. Uh, it, I remember the day where at about five o'clock, you know, end of day, I I started to see like all of these tweets that had Hootsuite and then a whole bunch of uh, Japanese kanji. And I, and I took it into Google Translate and there was an influencer that said, hey, this is a really cool tool. tool. And, and people were talking about it and it started to spread virally in that market. Um, we, we started doing really, you know, simple hacks in terms of, um, uh, you know, I, I kind of sent a hello world back to the influencer, like a thank you and in, from Google Translate and it was, you know, I'm sure it was horribly mashed up, um, but but it was uh, you know it was the start of it. Uh, we did localize on on uh, over 13 languages. We crowdsourced our language translation using a bunch of different tools, and a lot of companies have done this, uh, Evernote and others. Um, there there's kind of a playbook on localizing, and we did it very capitally efficient. We didn't hire translators. We did it you know through crowdsource methods. Um, but what we saw in terms of our community was that we had we had Japanese um, influencers and power users that were going through our product, uh, filming it on on uh, YouTube, and then putting translations for our UI, like 
this is the submit button, and this is you know where you post, and all this stuff. And it was amazing that that the, the, there was such a need for our product that people were going through and spending that time doing the work. Well, I mean that's sort of a growth hack as well to to identify people who are you know instead of blanketing Japan with AdWords to kind of figure out okay who are the people who who might uh, you know who have influence in this community and whether that's press or not. I mean. You know, did, did you sort of actively look for people like that in, in new markets as you tried to expand? Yeah, you know, when when you're a startup, you're capitally constrained. It's it's inevitable. Um, I and and I think that that those capital constraints uh, force you to focus on the highest ROI. So where you know you've got so many hours in a day, your team has so many hours in a day. Where are you going to be able to spend your time to get the most efficient uh, adoption of your product? Um, and so com building community and influencers was was very valuable to us in the early days. Uh, you know, finding that one person that sent a tweet out to a, you know a million people, um, hugely valuable. And and so we focused a lot on that, and and, and that's a huge part of our success. And, and and every single startup in this room has access to these tools now: uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Periscope. You know, everybody has a has a, a, a TV studio in their pocket. They can they can transmit video live globally uh, for zero cost. That's an amazing uh, amazing time that we live in, where we're able to do this uh, and able to identify people that you want to try to track down as influencers. You know, you can find somebody on LinkedIn. In that is influential about your area of business and, and really dig into you know, connecting with them and, and uh, telling them your story. And uh, as, a, as a CEO and a founder, your job is to be able to tell a story of your product and, and get people interested and excited about it. I want to talk a little bit about funding. I mean, I, I think it's something we talk about a lot. We know, you know there's discussions all the time, when to do it, how much to take, how much power to give up and control. Um, I mean, maybe you can, is there some sort of anecdote or something when you were really starting to look for, for, for money? You needed something to kind of, you know, boost you guys up, um, you know, but, you know, your, your, your idea wasn't necessarily proven yet or as much as maybe some of your investors wanted. I mean, what was, um, you know, how did that back and forth go and how did you sort of make sure that you kept in control of that process? Yeah. So, uh we, as I said, the, the product came out of uh, Invoke, uh, my agency. Uh, we bootstrapped um, the the company, bootstrapped Hootsuite for for over a year, and and uh, you know it was it was credit card time. We were we were you know putting it on um, on onto the credit card. We had uh, at the end of the year we had a seven person out of you know our total twenty one person team working on a zero revenue product. So the the economics suck. Uh, but but the growth and traction that we had was really amazing, and and so we knew we couldn't you know couldn't just shelf it. We had to we had to keep building it. So six months in, uh, we started fundraising because we we saw that you know we were focused on building product, getting ahead of the market, and that was just going to take time. We we couldn't monetize right away. Um, had we been able to monetize immediately, you know, it was going to take us a bunch of months to build out. Had we been able to monetize uh, right away, maybe we wouldn't have needed the investment or, or would have waited to a later stage. But we were, um, we, we closed a round of financing one year in. Uh, one year later, we launched our productization. We felt like we had enough of a lead in the market and that we were able to kind of spend a few months working on the, on the, um, on the productization and the, and the payment plans. Um, that so so in terms of fundraising, uh, it was a, it wasn't the best time to be fundraising. Uh, you know, I, I talked in the, to folks in the Vancouver market. Um, people were just kind of getting up to speed on social. Uh, it, it, we just couldn't find anybody here that it resonated with. Uh, I, went, I went to San Francisco, New York. We found some investors there. Uh, it, was a, it was a tough time because those other guys that I mentioned, TweetDeck and, and Seismic, had all gone through the market. And, and I was like the fourth social media uh, tool that had come through. And they were like, oh yeah, I've, I've, my friends all invested in this one or this one or this one. And so it was a, it was a, a really tough time. We, we had uh, a couple, couple folks that stepped up um, that, that gave us the money we needed, and it, and it was fantastic. I have to say to everybody in this room, though, that now is absolutely the best time to fundraise the, in, the, in the history of mankind for software. It, it, is, it is pretty fantastic. Um, you've got so you wish you were starting now. 
Well, I mean, look, the, the wave has moved on. I would not start a social relationship platform today, but if I was fundraising and I had to fundraise at any point in time, today would be the best time I've ever seen. Um, you've got tools like AngelList. You've got, uh, you know, a lot of great stories. Uh, Recon, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was a board member until yesterday. $175 million exit uh, in the market. A lot, of the, a lot of that cap table was in Vancouver. Uh, those people are going to be looking to reallocate money and, and make other bets. Fantastic time to be fundraising. So and go look for the recon people if they <laughs> might have some money to give you. Yeah. Um, so, so and, and the other thing is, is when you have great stories like, like Recon, like Shopify, like ourselves, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of investors realize that they missed those early opportunities. And, and I do get young entrepreneurs that say, hey, I, I thank you because I talk to investors and I say, I'm going to build the next Hootsuite in Vancouver. I'm going to build the next Recon or next Shopify and you should invest in me because of that. It does make people's lives easier. And so having these exciting stories happen is huge. Um, and, and there are so many other really interesting and vibrant uh, companies that are, that are getting built out right now in this city. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, and let's talk about Canada specifically because, you know, we do have these great stories that are happening now, especially the last few months have been really exciting in technology here. Um, but you still, talking to people, you still hear a lot about, you know, okay, well, if I've got, you know, if I'm raising $10 million and I've got a concept that's pretty proven. I don't have a problem getting a, a Silicon Valley investor to come up here and giving me money. But when I'm just starting and I'm Canadian and I'm in Waterloo or Vancouver or Ottawa or Toronto, um, you know, it is, there's not as much seed funding in this country, not as much angel funding. So, um, you know, what do you, what, what's sort of your advice to people just starting out in Canada? So I, I don't know if I, necessarily agree with that proportionately. I mean, there's, there's maybe not as, not as much seed money, but there's also not as many startups as there is in San Francisco. So you got you to balance that out. I think um, when, when I was fundraising back in the day, Grandpa Holmes here, um, there were... Um, there, there was that conversation about, you know, are you going to move the team down to San Francisco? And... Uh, and I, I just felt like the writing was on the wall. We're, we're seeing an absolute decentralization of, of tech startups around the world. We've got you know tech innovation centers, and you know I was in in Boulder on on Monday, and and that's you know uh, kind of Vancouver's Whistler. It's a it's a ski town. I mean it's it's a, a small place, and there are so many cool startups there. Uh, Austin. New York, everywhere, Vancouver, Montreal, the, there, is, uh, there is no reason that a startup needs to, to necessarily be centered in San Francisco, and, and to some extent, I think it can be a detriment. Uh, there's a huge uh, competition for, for talent. Uh, I realized if I was going there, I was gonna be competing with Facebook, Google, um, and every other you know, amazing startup out there, and there's a, there's a lot of unicorns. We happen to be unicorn, that's fantastic, but you're gonna be competing with everybody else, so you need to find your story and your narrative and, and, and think about what's important for your business, what uh, maps to your culture. Um, and, and we had a team here, our culture was established, uh, and, and I felt like it was really important for us to continue to build you know, our story in this city. So um, I think we've only got a couple minutes left here. Um, I mean, for Hootsuite itself, you guys have you know, raised some huge funding rounds, and there's a point I think you were hiring 10 people a week. Um, and, and so I, I just want to know, you know what's next for you guys. I mean, we had Shopify really successful, and um, you know, I mean, that's got to be something where even if you do have a timeline that isn't necessarily imminent to to go public, it's got to get you thinking about, you know, well, if the market is really receptive to this, Canadian investors, U.S. investors want this kind of company. I mean, wh what are your plans for that? Yeah, so so Shopify IPO was uh, a massive success. I'm so happy for that team. Um, they they did a great job. You know, I've talked to them a lot about their process and and what they did. Um, it is something that we're, you know, we are thinking about. I think providing liquidity for your your team and investors is is important, and we need to do that at some point. Um, you know, I, I, I and I, I never say never. We're building a company that has uh, fundamentals of a public company because you know, as you get to a, a larger stage, you need to have these systems in place, and it makes sense. So, from a business perspective, it makes sense to build what looks like a public company. Um, 
And then, you know, if and when the timing is right, we will we'll approach that. Um, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's it, people are always interested in is that the next step for us. I, I think about, you know, IPO is, is, is a, a step along the way. It is not the finish line. And I think a lot of people have the perception that that's the finish line, but it absolutely isn't. You have to, you know, think about where your company is going over the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Um, and and I'm, I'm really passionate about continuing to build out our product line. We are, you know, building a suite of products into our, our social relationship platform. We have uh, over 200 uh, unique companies that have built out applications into our application directory, so we're creating a vibrant ecosystem. Um, some of those partners have made hundreds of thousands of dollars out of our ecosystem, and so it starts to become economically interesting for developers to build on our platform. And uh, and I think that that is, is you know where companies like Salesforce, for example, has had a massive success in creating an ecosystem where people can make a, a real living and a real business off of their platform so so I would I would love to do that um, and and you know if I think ahead you know where we look you know what we look like in 10 years uh, you know I'd like to build a, a company to the scale of, of Adobe or Salesforce um, in Canada I, I think we have you know all of the talent here um, I think you know we, we use cloud hosting and all this other stuff there are no constraints to us being able to do that um, and, and I want to make sure that capital constraints don't become a, a an issue with the you know our ability to, to take down a huge piece of this market. Okay, I think that's, that's, that's it for us. I think we're at time. Someone going to come and t rescue us? or should we, I, I can keep going. <laughs>